Good morning. Um, it's uh, as an obstetrician gynecologist, it's always interesting that I'm um, sorry, I just have to get used to this. Um, that I'm asked to speak at a conference on congenital heart disease. And, and it's really a testament to um, the wonderful care that so many of you all provide to children and adults with congenital heart disease that I'm even here to speak at, at this type of a conference. Um, that being said, um, I always remember one of the first times, uh, one of the first referrals I, I got it was a patient um, that had a Fontan who was about 21 years old and uh, was pregnant. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, this patient is pregnant. Or, I'm sorry, oh, this patient has a Fontan. So what am I gonna do? Um, so I called my friend who, who I worked with, a uh, cardiologist at the time, and his response to me was, oh my God, this patient is pregnant. So you can see there that we approach these things with kind of a different mindset. And I think it highlights the need that, that we need to work together for the care of these types of patients. Um, so again, uh, at this again slide shows the increase in survival um, with, uh, of patients who have congenital heart disease. And you can see that um, for children born in the 1980s, 80, roughly 85% um, reach adulthood. And uh, along with reaching adulthood, the quality of life for these, um, for these uh, women in particular is much uh, better than what it's been. And so many of them uh, either are considering pregnancy or end up um, getting pregnant. So um, it's, a, it's a new uh, challenge that we have based on the care that, that the wonderful care that you've all provided. Um, so what is it about pregnancy that, that can be challenging in these patients? Uh, well, pregnancy is a, <clears throat> poses a serious um, and a significant stress to um, uh, the heart. Um, and probably the, the, the highlight of that is that there is a significant increase in cardiac output. So um, it, it, cardiac output increases by up to 50% by the third trimester. So the heart is, uh, is going to need to pump more blood. Um, and this is primarily mediated through stroke volume. So um, contractility needs to be there, that the heart needs to be able to uh, address this. And this is associated with a significant increase in plasma volume and red cell mass um, that also occurs. The other key physiologic um, finding in pregnancy is, is hypercoagulability. There's an increase in the uh, number of clotting factors and also a decrease in endogenous anticoagulants. So uh, in pregnancy, Thrombosis, thromboembolic disease is a significant problem and, and thrombosis can occur. Um, and that's very important for certain patients um, with congenital heart disease. The other thing with uh, heart disease in general and, pregnant, and pregnancy that can make diagnosis sometimes very difficult is that symptoms of normal pregnancy, which are kind of shown in the box, also overlap significantly with those um, symptoms associated with cardiovascular disease. Uh, and this often leads to delayed diagnosis of many um, cardiovascular uh, complications that can occur in, in pregnant women. So in trying to understand how to take care of these patients best, um, there have been, uh, you know, it's kind of important to try to develop a, an idea of which patients are at the greatest risk for problems. So there have been a number of studies done and they have very interesting names. Um, we have the CARPREG risk score, the Zahara study predictors. And these early studies um, sought to identify uh, risk factors for um, cardiovascular events occurring during pregnancy in women with underlying heart disease. Um, and they identified a, a number of risk factors, um, including you know, left uh, heart obstruction, uh, decreased ejection fraction of, um, or left heart function, um, being having a mechanical heart valve, uh, being on cardiovascular medication prior to pregnancy, uh, a New York Health uh, classification of uh, stage three or four, um, or the presence of cyanotic heart disease, and a history of a prior um, you know, cardiac event, whether it's an arrhythmia or myocardial infarction or cerebrovascular accident. So having these various things would put you at higher risk for having complications, a cardiovascular complication during pregnancy. 
but these studies were somewhat limited and, and, um, not, and quite not very comprehensive in terms of the types of conditions that, that they looked at. Um, so more recently, the World Health Organization has a modified risk classification that sort of integrates all known maternal cardio risk factors, including heart disease and comorbidities. And it's, again, quite a bit more comprehensive than the earlier studies. And so I just want to go through this. The, uh, the WHO's uh, classification uh, puts patients into one of four categories uh, based on their level of risk. Um, so uh, class one, and you can see these conditions here are, are, again, there isn't a significant increase in risk for maternal mortality uh, and very mild increases in morbidity. And these patients generally need, um, you know, some minimal follow-up, and, and most of them do very, very well throughout pregnancy. And um, there isn't a lot that we need to do in, in most of these cases. Um, class two, again, most of these patients do very, very well. You can see here the repaired tetralogy of Fallot. Um, there's a small increase in, in, in complications, uh, and they need to be watched a little bit closer, probably in conjunction with a cardiologist uh, and a maternal fetal medicine specialist. But many of these patients can deliver um, at their institutions and, um, and just if they have co-management with uh, maternal fetal medicine and, uh, and, and cardiology. Um, then we get into patients that are sort of borderline between class two and class three. Um, and you can see here there's a, a more significant increase in some of these patients. And it's sort of dependent on the individual and other comorbidities that they might have as to what their actual level of risk is going to be. So uh, we'll see some increase in maternal mortality and morbidity. And these patients will need a little bit more frequent um, follow-up throughout the pregnancy, both with cardiology and uh, and also after childbirth, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in a little bit. Um, so, and then these are class three, clearly, and these are patients that are at more significant risk and really need to be followed closely at a tertiary care center with a cardiologist who's um, knowledgeable in congenital heart disease or cardiology or, um, and a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And you can see this is, these are the patients with the mechanical valves of Fontan circulation, uh, complex congenital heart disease, and then uh, aortopathy with significant root dilation. Um, and lastly, there's a, a class four, which is going to be addressed in one of the other talks today. But these are uh, patients that uh, we don't necessarily recommend pregnancy in. Um, and if they do show up pregnant, uh, we often will have a t talk with them about whether or not to continue the pregnancy. Um, if you do choose to continue the pregnancy, uh, there is a very high, higher, significantly higher risk for mortality and serious morbidity. So these patients need to be followed very, very closely. Well, we talked about the mom. What happens to the baby in these conditions? Well, um, interestingly, the uh, risk for neonatal complications is also increased in patients with heart disease. Um, and that includes primarily premature delivery uh, and low birth weight. Um, a lot of this occurs due to increased risk for pregnancy-related complications, uh, such as preeclampsia. There's also a higher level of risk um, uh, for congenital heart disease in, in the newborn if the mother is affected with congenital heart disease. And that um, is about 3 to 5 percent, depending on the, on the underlying condition. Um, so, and some of the maternal risk factors that are associated with um, uh, adverse neonatal outcomes are presented in the box um, there. And you can see, again, it's similar to uh, some of the things that, that cause adverse maternal outcomes as well. So, one of the lost arts in obstetrics is, is preconceptional care. Um, and uh, we, unfortunately, we don't do enough of this. And, and this is an area where uh, we try to do put a lot of emphasis into um, in our program, which I'll, I'll talk about um, shortly. Um, but one of the key things is that optimization of health uh, prior to pregnancy is, is very important in preventing adverse outcomes uh, and improving outcomes. Um, so, and that's something, again, that we really strive to do. Um, one of the interesting things in, when, you're, when you refer to patient, it's much easier to evaluate them completely before they're pregnant 
um, because there are many diagnostic procedures that can't be performed during pregnancy because of radiation exposure or, or um, a stress for a stress test, for example, which you may not be able to do in pregnancy. Um, so it is um, <clears throat> helpful to have these patients prior to pregnancy. It, uh, preconception evaluation also offers the ability to um, adjust medications um, and uh, inst institute lifestyle modifications, which can be helpful. Um, and our approach um, to care once the patient gets pregnant is really a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and you can see the, the top figure there with all the different specialties that are involved. Um, and we basically will you know, outline a cardiovascular follow-up and plan for the pregnancy. And this is, again, individualized according to the risks and anticipated complications. Our care will include um, you know, uh, routine obstetrical care along with a serial assessment of cardiac um, function and status. Um, throughout the pregnancy. Uh, we also will do delivery planning, including the mode of delivery, uh, the timing of delivery, and the location of delivery. Um, delivery itself poses an additional challenge for these uh, patients. There is a further increase in cardiac output that's required, um, and that even increases more in the, in the second trimester with pushing. In general, um, we strive for a vaginal delivery in most patients uh, with congenital heart disease um, as it's, it's safer and, and better uh, for them, associated with less um, fluid hemodynamic changes. Um, we, can also, we also recommend a epidural anesthesia for almost all of these patients because it really decreases pain and um, helps with the hemodynamic load that the heart faces during pregnancy. There are certain conditions, particularly uh, when you have a dilated aortic root um, where um, we do or severe um, aortic <laughs> stenosis or severe heart failure where we do recommend a cesarean delivery because it's unlikely that the patient will be able to tolerate labor or they're at significant risk for aortic dissection during labor. Contraception after pregnancy is also important for patients with congenital heart disease and here at the Cleveland Clinic we have a um, a service that uh, addresses um, contraception, contraceptive options for patients with significant uh, uh, medical and, and surgical conditions and cardiovascular disease and congenital heart disease um, obviously falls into that. Intrauterine device is a, is a, is a very helpful, um, is a very good form of contraception for many of these patients, especially if they can't take hormonal methods. <clears throat> 